Good afternoon all and thank you for joining us today um, for the Real Estate Investment Manager of the Future. Before we start our webinar, we're just going to give some people a few moments to join us. So very welcome to you here from Oxford Side Business School and hope you're having a wonderful day where you are, whether this is early morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you for joining us. So this webinar is in support of the Oxford Real Estate Programme here at Side Business School, University of Oxford, and we're delighted to be joined today by Professor Andrew Baum, Valentina Shigoyan and Peter Ferrari, who will be discussing some key topics that are probably on your minds at the moment. So it's going to be a riveting afternoon, and okay. we will also be making sure that we have some time for Q&A. But before I hand it over to our hosts, just a few few housekeepings. So today your microphones will be muted. However, if you do have any questions, please do pop them into the Q&A box. We'll be reviewing all of your questions and there will be time at the end of the webinar for us to answer some of them. Um, just before we begin, thank you once again. I will hand over to Valentina Chigoyan to make her introductions. Thank you, Clara. Hi, everyone. My name is Valentina Shigoyan. I'm a founding partner of Opcream. At Opcream, we work closely with real estate decorators of niche spaces, spaces like student, student accommodation, co-living, co-working, uh, senior living, storage, data centers, you name it. So we help operators to find capital, we invest and co-invest with them. And on the other hand, we are helping real estate investment managers and real estate corporates to partner with right operators on their spaces. Before that, I spent nearly five years in real estate venture capital, investing in prop tech startups. And before that, for 15 years, I was in real estate finance and financial advisory. Peter, over to you. Thank you, Valentina. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, good to join you. Um, I'm Peter Ferrari. I'm Chief Executive of Ashby Capital. Um, Ashby Capital uh, is a real estate investment manager, um, 10 years standing. Um, we are, uh, we invest uh, for the long term um, with a focus on income. Um, and we have about one and a half billion under management uh, currently. Um, I've been in the industry getting on for 40 years. First 30 years of that I spent as a, primarily as a developer um, and uh, investment trader, I suppose you would say. And, um, you know, now we are uh, in the investment management business and, um, you know, the investment manager of the future, perhaps. <laughs> yes. Thank yes. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Valentina. Thanks, Peter. Um, yes, so my name is Andrew Borman. I'm the Programme Director of the Oxford Real Estate Programme, and I'm an Emeritus Professor in the Side Business School at the University of Oxford. So we're going to kick off by, um, by me presenting some slides. Um, I will try to make it uh, happen reasonably quickly, and then uh, I'm going to ask Valentina to give, give her perspective on, on what she would do if she was setting up an investment management business from scratch, you know, what would the investment manager of the future look like from her point of view? And then we're going to hand over to Peter to talk about what you might see as a reasonably traditional investment business and how that's coping with the challenges that are being thrown at it by people like me. Um, so after that, we'll have a, a conversation between the three of us and then we'll open it up to questions from the chat. So please do post your questions. We will be keenly interested in going over to answer them. And then back to Clara at the end of the session. So you've you've met the speakers. The uh, the, the, the stimulus for the for the podcast or the webcast is the paper on the right of this slide, the real estate investment manager of the future, which is available on, on my website. And if any of you uh, or having any difficulty finding this paper, then we'll be very happy to email you a copy. 
Uh, this is written by Valentina and myself, focused on, on exactly the issues that we're talking about in the next, in the next 45 minutes. So where we're coming from is, is really two pieces. I know there are three bullet points on this slide, which is not helpful at that point, but there are two really there are two perspectives on this. The first perspective is that there are challenges, as there always are. You know, there are there are always economic challenges, political challenges, technological challenges facing investment managers in all sectors. Um, right now, I see them as quite acute. Um, so there are economic challenges disrupting real estate. There are challenges faced by real estate investment managers. And I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on those, if you like, problematic parts of being an investment manager. And then Valentina will switch on to the more positive messages for how what strategies investment managers might use to future proof their business. So I could I could say that fund managers are facing something like a, a perfect storm. The first thing that that they're having to cope with is the impact of the fourth industrial revolution or technology on their businesses. Now, of course, some of them see this as an opportunity and they're using technology to great effect. Um, others will see it as a challenge. And I think the, the best way of explaining why this is a challenge is the impact of Amazon on retail property. So if we looked at shopping centers 25, 30 years ago, they would have been the most popular asset types for real estate investors. Now they're not. The, the reason for that is almost wholly to do with technology, uh, the impact of online retailing. And so that's what I mean by the challenges that fund managers are facing because of the, the tech impact. And, you know, we could say that offices are going through the same challenges. If people can work from home, then is it a good idea to invest in office buildings is an open question, which I'm sure Peter will, will address. Um, so that's the decline of the core property sectors. That's the um, the impact on retail and office um, of of technology. And if if your core business is under attack, it, it clearly means that you're you're going to have some challenges. Then investors, uh, I think, following the global financial crisis, a lot of investors decided that they they trusted their investment managers less than they used to. Uh, there was a sort of a movement by investors to take back some control, particularly pension funds. And in, in some markets, the UK being a pretty good example, there's a real decline in the amount of capital available from the traditional sources, the pension funds and insurance companies. So investment managers have got to think hard about where they raise their capital. Then, as ever, we, we're seeing more and more regulation. The regulation is to do with investor protection, money laundering, know your customer, but it's also to do with environmental issues. So we have EPC ratings, which are applied to buildings. Uh, again, taking the UK as an example, uh, office buildings, commercial property buildings will not be leasable uh, in, in the year 2030 unless they reach a certain environmental standard. Now, whether the government commits to that is an open question, but that's clearly just an example of the increased regulation, which is, which is being thrown at the industry. Um, we got used to the idea that returns were pretty low, um, and it was an issue three years ago that, that the IRR on a really high quality property investment was, was being pushed all the way down to something like 4%. So that if you wanted to buy a prime office building somewhere, you might have to accept a pretty low IRR. And then ESG requirements I've talked about. Now, uh, a lot of this has, has changed in the lower core co -retur return issue has changed because the interest rate, um, the increase in interest rates that happened in the last two years has, has reversed that issue. So now we're seeing higher core returns, but the market is still working through the impact of higher interest rates, which is causing some stress. And if you've got a, a, a highly leveraged property portfolio, where values have gone down and interest rates have gone up. It's a pretty nasty place to be. So that's a set of the challenges. I'm sure there are more. Um, there always are, but it, it does feel like we're in a bit of a, uh, a pinch point. And I think this, this, this is one of two pictures that I'll show you, which, which tend to encapsulate my sort of concerns for the sector. So at the top, we have traditional real estate investment, which was offices, retail, industrial, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, a lot of money was in those sectors. Now, fund managers are getting more and more interested in, in the living sectors and the 
um, alternative sectors, as we might call them. So the alternative sectors, medical, educational, waste, energy generation, um, these, these property types are, are of interest to, uh, they have been of interest to American investors for quite a long time. I happen to chair a, a property and fund manager at the moment, which focuses on those sectors, educational, property, medical, and so on. Uh, we call it a social infrastructure investor. And the problem for real estate fund managers is they're, they're new sectors, they are difficult to access, and they're also interesting to infrastructure managers. So, you know, there's a competition going on for those assets, and it's not obvious how a traditional fund manager would move into those sectors. And then the the, the third sector, living, residential. Um, Peter and I have talked about this at great length. Would you really want to buy a lot of residential property? And the, the challenge is, for doing that are number one, it's very hard to aggregate significant portfolios of residential property because the lot size, the unit size is small. There is always the risk of, of, of political interference by governments protecting tenants. And there's a risk of reputational damage as well, because if you wanted to kick out a tenant that wasn't paying his or her rent and they had a good reason for not paying their rent, that's a difficult situation for a fund manager. And these, these that sort of I think that explains why these sectors are difficult because they are operational. You know, you, you have to be involved with tenant management and you have to be aware of the impact on people's lives by managing these sorts of assets, these living assets. So it means that the traditional real estate investment universe is being nibbled away at by operational difficult sectors and by infrastructure property types. And it's an open question that we'll discuss about whether you can really make a successful business without being extremely operational or being in infrastructure. And I'm, and I'm sure we've all got opinions on that. The second, the second set of issues I think are to do with sustainability. And uh, for, for quite a long time, and as part of the Oxford Real Estate Programme, we focus on this quite a lot. We're interested of course in economic sustainability. That's the number one objective of an investment manager is to produce assets that will deliver returns. Um, the big challenge right now on that is interest rates. So we're, we're going through a reset. Um, in the short term, it's, it's nasty, it's damaging. It means that our interest rate payments, our interest payments have gone up, the values of our buildings have gone down. It creates problems with bankers. Um, it causes all sorts of stresses. Of course, in the long run, it's a good thing because the expected return on the asset is probably going to be higher going forwards because returns have to be higher in a higher interest rate environment. So short-term shock, long-term gain possibly. We also need to produce buildings which are environmentally sustainable. And we're all really, uh, we're all highly aware of this issue. Uh, we're aware of it because of the investors giving money on condition that we do the right thing, because we are dealing with tenants, customers, occupiers who want the right sorts of buildings which are environmentally sustainable and also because it's the right thing to do. And government regulations, of course, might force us to behave in a certain way. So we're all aware of that. And then on top of that, I think there's a pressure to be socially impactful. Now that doesn't mean that we have to compromise on returns in order to deliver social impact. But I think there's an increasing awareness that as, as the rich have got richer and the poor have got poorer in many countries, there's a danger that if investment managers aren't aware of social impact, then th th we end up with, an, with a very unhappy society. And I think the, the challenge is there for investment managers to do their part. In the UK, for example, we have this concept of levelling up. It's a classic example of, of being a socially aware investor. Should we be putting money into parts of the country that are, that are poorer? in order that we, we get better returns, but also that we make people's lives better. So these are all pressures on, on investment managers. Um, just had a question from Florian. I'll come back to that, that later. Um, so uh, he's talking about the risk, hedging against the risk of stranded assets and ensuring long-term viability of their portfolio. So Valentina, that's probably one for you to, uh, to address. What financial mechanisms and investment strategies can real estate managers employ to hedge against the risk of stranded assets? So we'll come back to that later. Okay, so the drivers of the drivers of value in the property markets have changed. We, we've seen, you know, dying property types is a very dramatic way of putting this, but the damage to the shopping centre market is an example of a 
of a sector that's been under some sort of existential threat. And digital technology has clearly disrupted commercial property much more than residential property, because the one thing that you do know you will have to have, even if you can use technology, is you need somewhere to live. And the, the, the sort of increase in house prices since COVID in some countries is, is indicative of that. And we've got completely new property types that we can invest in. Um, data centers is, is probably the best example, but there are many others, even satellite stations we were looking at recently as an investment asset. Uh, carbon sequestration, carbon storage, energy generation. These are all new investable property types. There's also a shift towards space as a service. And this is one of the issues that, that Valentina will be talking about, you know, the need for operational management of asset classes. So hotels against offices would be the example. Hotels are operationally intensive. Offices don't need to be operationally intensive if you have a single tenant let on a long lease. So as leases get shorter, the idea about space as a service and, ho and hotelization starts to apply itself to, to office buildings. And that's a question for Peter, I think, to come back to us about and how that's affected his business, you know, th this idea. And then and finally, uh, demographics aren't particularly supportive of commercial real estate, but they're wonderfully supportive of residential property. So as we get older, um, there's going to be more and more demand for housing. And so the, the economics supporting housing are are extremely positive and governments are going to have to think about this, whereas um, we're not working longer. There's, you know, the, the demographic change isn't leading people to work to the age of 80, which increases demand for office space. That might change, of course, but right now we're not seeing that happen yet. Um, of course, the impact of the COVID crisis uh, was not positive on the property market. It meant that we, we, we suffered diminution of values uh, we had empty properties. We, we've had all sorts of issues coming out of that, but also the increase in interest rates have damaged values. And I'm, I'm quite shocked myself by these numbers. The average return on the UK property market on leveraged since 1971 is, is around 10% a year. Uh, with inflation running nearly six, that's about 4% real return every year for um, 50 years. Um, the, re the return on average over the last six years has been minus three and a half percent. That sort of crept up on me unawares, I think. I wasn't quite aware about, about that. And of course, that's, that's pretty bad news if you're trying to sell the investment to potential capital sources. As I said before, in the long run, it might be a good thing to have a reset, but it's uh, short term, it doesn't look great. Um, we hear a lot of talk about the emerging sectors, you know, the uh, the sectors that are now popular with investors and, and sheds, beds, eds, meds is one of the one of the themes that is used to illustrate this change uh, at Newport Capital. We just bought a mortuary. So actually it sheds, beds, eds, meds and deads now is the is the what we should be talking about. Now, these sectors are difficult um, for investment managers. They're, they're very different from buying an office building and buying a, a retail or a shopping centre. So the, the tech revolution has, has put this focus on these theoretically um, resilient sectors, sectors that are resilient in the face of technological change. So the argument for these emerging sectors and residential is that they're resilient in the face of technology. You need somewhere to work. You need, sorry, so you need somewhere to. It's a long time since we're going to study at home. We're going to need healthcare centres. Of course, we need beds and so on. the The US market has sort of um, anticipated this change over quite a long period since the year two thousand. The average amount of money in office, retail, and residential was seventy percent, and now it's fallen to about forty percent. the The difference is taken up by these emerging or next gen sectors as CBRE call them, self storage, lodging, um, resi and so on, social infrastructure. And the impact on property markets is, is, is very big. You know, the, this is, these, these numbers are quite dramatic. This is the UK property market again, as an example, it shows in 1991 that about 85% of all institutional money was in retail and office. In 2002, it was still around 85%, although retail had picked up more and offices had declined a little bit. Um, by 2023, now that number is below 45%. So we've gone from 85 to 45%. So there's been a lot of selling 
and a lot of value destruction in these sectors on average. Industrial, of course, has become incredibly popular because the decline of retail has been mirrored by the increase in interest in industrial, which has gone from 13 to 32 percent of institutional investment. And it's now the biggest sector, which is, again, something of a shock. But I think the real news is in the increase in residential and other, which has gone from 2 percent in total in 1991. So just to get your head around this, it meant that institutional investors in the UK were putting no more than 2 percent of their investments in housing or social housing or education property or any of those social infrastructure sectors. By 2022, that had increased to 3%, but in 2023, it's now 27%. Uh, where we're heading by 2030, who knows? But it looks very, very unlikely those, that those trends will not continue. So 27% uh, of institutional money is now in residential number in these social infrastructure and living sectors. And I think that number will increase. Part of the reason for that is worries about stranded assets. Uh, the, the sector that gets the most attention in this context is offices, you know, sort of tertiary offices around the edge of London, not being fit for purpose, not being convertible. Will they become stranded assets? Um, so we've, we've also been uh, faced with a challenge of changing revenue models. Um, again, 25 years ago, we had Typically, we had long leases, 15 to 25 years, um, often single tenants, big companies like law firms, financial organisations. Now, the average lease length in the UK has, has fallen from around 15 to around six years. Um, so we're now having to be a lot more nimble in asset management. And as tenants demand more services, if, they have, if, if their employees have a choice of working from home, then they're entitled to demand more services from the office buildings that they occupy. And we've also seen increases in turnover rents in shopping centres. So the, the tenants saying that we will not pay a rent unless, we, unless you share some of the risk with us. Now, that might happen in office buildings one day. You know, there are already attempts to charge rents based on occupation of buildings so that buildings that are heavily occupied earn more rent. So this pressure to produce efficient buildings that are popular with people is, is incre increasing. So now instead of thinking about landlords and tenants with property managers collecting rent from the tenants, I think now it's better to think about investors operating buildings for the benefit of customers and providing services to those customers in order to maximise the revenue that they're prepared to pay. The investor may be the operator. It may be that the investor subcontracts to an operator. So an example of subcontracting would be. Would be I'm sorry. No. OK. So um, th this this change of model means that operational leverage is increasing. It's, it's riskier. It's riskier to run a property investment where you've got costs, because if your revenue falls, your net operating income is more sensitive than it used to be. So. Um, are these serious challenges? You know, we'll be interested in Peter's reaction to this. You know, how serious is this? Um, but before we do that, Valentina, what, what do you think investment managers should be doing to future-proof their businesses? Thanks, Andrea. That's a great presentation. Um, and on innovation, those are my favorite questions. So if there is one lesson I learned over the past five years that I spent in innovation and tech, is that innovation is uncomfortable, innovation is hard. One needs to have a very good reason to innovate. And if you ask investment managers today, they would share all the issues and concerns, but a lot of those would say, well, but things will go back to, to normal. So we, we, we've been through cycles before. That's not the first one. So for this reason, I first want to give a definition of innovation. Innovation means systematic practice of developing and marketing new products and services systematic, it is difficult, it is expensive. And the, there are two key questions that investment managers should ask themselves before deciding on innovation. Has the customer profile changed? That's first. And second, does the product require modifications? Andrew, you had some great uh, data and statistics in your presentation, but I do want to add a little bit more to that to just emphasize the point. First of all, when it comes to operational real estate, so everything that was shown on your slide with MSCI as other and residential, those operational real estate sectors in the UK has already reached 
223 billion pounds. And it is expected that this number will go three times from now. Just think about it, because this will exceed the volume of all currently institutionally invested real estate in the UK. So all the alternative sectors in living, co-working, storage, data centers are set to outgrow offices, retail, and logistics. This is the answer to the question of what is going to happen in 2031. In 2031, you're likely to see more than 50% in other and residential. So does the customer profile change? Yes, it does, big time. And then I do want to elaborate a little bit on a slide with stranded assets. You mentioned it's 5 to 16 trillion USD opportunity or problem issue. But that's stranded assets for, their, for the reason of climate and energy uh, regulations. One should add to that the volume of assets that are operationally no longer fit for purpose. And if you read different research and different estimates, that account amounts to a third of currently owned real estate by, institu by institutional investors is set to be repurposed over the course of next five years. And the most common repurposing is from offices and retail into residential and mixed use. So there we go. Uh, it's definitely time to innovate and both product and the customer profile are changing. So the most important thing that happens by, when we move into operational segments and they turn what used to be called alternative real estate, real estate is moving from B2B to B2C business. So we're no longer servicing big corporates customers on 20 year leases. We are now shifting the focus to an end user and end user is becoming a client. To successfully deploy capital in such, in such strategies, one has to have in-depth knowledge of occupiers in every single vertical. How do those end users, customers of space behave? What space do they prefer? How do they engage with the product? How can you maximize revenue by cross-selling space? How can you use space during daytime one way and nighttime another? We are walking away from long leases as well as from triple net rents. That's a big shift uh, on, uh, as, uh, on how we sell real estate. What, what, the, what is the product in real estate that we sell ultimately to the clients? Investment managers haven't had those headaches before. The power shifts away from capital towards market expertise. And a new market player is emerging. Arguably, there is a new market player emerging, which is called pure play asset light operator. And a player that represents demand and an occupier. So the mind, mindset and real estate shifts from servicing the building, that's what facility managers and property managers used to be, used to be doing, and servicing capital, that's what asset managers and fund managers used to be doing, to servicing the customer. Nobody has ever been doing that. We used to be signing long leases and we wouldn't know, we wouldn't even mind if their asset is effectively underoccupied because long leases would just do the job. So now the question is how one is to innovate in investment management. And to my mind, the key question here is, do you lead with capital or do, or do you lead with expertise? Historically, real estate investment management was successful because the, the most successful ones were the ones who could raise more capital. Real estate is a capital intensive business. Few hundred million dollar fund would only allow you to buy a handful number of assets. Cash is king was the paradigm established since the global financial crisis. This paradigm is being challenged now. Cash is no longer king. Capital follows the expertise. Players who are able to raise capital on this market are experts within their niche verticals. Just before this webinar, I checked the news and companies that currently raise or are able, investment managers are able to raise capital. I'm reading from the screen. Blackstone raises more than 30 billion for giant real estate fund, targeting opportunistic deals across sectors such as rental housing, hospitality, data centers. Harrison Street reaches two billion US dollar mark fund um, nine uh, that targets sectors that include senior housing, student housing, healthcare delivery, life sciences, built to rent data centers and self-storage. Novin has earlier this month announced plans to stack up a 3 billion euro 
self storage platform. So you start listing with being an expert and select operational segments. This way, by the way, another example that we talk a lot about is Graystar. Graystar started by being an, an, an expert in multifamily operations, and then they moved uh, into building a vertically integrated platform and becoming investment manager themselves. Graystar is a single vertical focused investment manager. So that's innovative, but is it innovative enough? Is it possible to be an expert in dozens of real estate verticals and able to un unlock mixed use repurposing at scale? So those 30% of currently owned by institutional investors who nobody is prepared to touch it at the moment. Is there a player who can unlock mixed use development? A huge opportunity in the next five years. Just to uh, mention that we are trying to build this investment management of the future at Oprim. We are building expertise. We lead with an expertise. We work with emerging operators. Whether it's the right approach or not, I don't know. Uh, and I would be curious to know how, Peter, how you uh, at Ashby Capital uh, solve this issue because you are a player for, for a number of years now, Peter. So, Peter, it's, um, yeah, it, yeah. it's clear that you, as, a, as an office and retail investor, you're a, a dinosaur. You're in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. <I'm, laughs> well, from my perspective, I'm the investment manager of the future. But there you go. It, it's uh, kind of uh, it's interesting how, um, you know, uh, there's possibly not one answer. I mean, just... Um, uh, picking up on some of the things you were saying, Valentina, you know, and you cited Blackstone and you were talking about, you know, do you, you know, is it, you, are you, you know, is, is it being an expert in, in the real estate or are you an expert capital raiser? You know, these are different, you know, Blackstone is an expert capital raiser from my perspective. That's what they're really good at. They're really good are at they not both? Well, this is the question. I mean, you get to such a size, can you be an expert in everything? I think that's the big existential question for Blackstone. You know, uh, how, do, how do you then deploy that, uh, that capital that you've expertly raised, the huge volumes of it uh, across every single sector? Can you, you know, how do you build a machine that can, uh, that can have the expertise to invest in all of those different segments? And you know, time will tell whether that model is sustainable over the long term. Yeah. In interesting, though, that they do they do seem to buy vertically into reasonably vertically integrated businesses with, yes. no, with no ambition to build a huge operational platform for the long term. They're quite happy to move in, move yes. out. They're opportun I would say they're opportunistic sort of uh, thematic sector investors. Um, but as you say, not necessarily long term. And uh, I think there's a difference between being a long-term investor, um, you know, committed to, uh, uh, and being a trader. Yeah. These Let's, are two different things. They're both called investors, but they're very, they're very different. It's a very different approach. If we, if we talk a bit about Ashby Capital, I know that Ashby yeah. Capital is a, a big a big investor in London office buildings. Yes. And there's been a, a developer or at least um, value-add investor in these buildings. Yes. Yeah. How how have you managed to you know on the on the presumption that you are running a successful business and, I, and you know I think you are yes um, how have you managed to stay ahead of this or or to resist the trend that is damaging the office market so what is it that makes a successful office investor in this market okay so I think what we've done um, you know from the outset is we have really focused our activities. Um, on on investing in in on on creating uh, and uh, investing in and managing the best quality um, office assets in central London, and by doing that, uh, we are able to uh, innovate, um, and we get, we are able to be very close to our customers. Uh, because we have a relatively small amount of very high value assets, so we can we can we can get our hands around it, and we understand um, um, exactly what's going on, what's required, and we can see the trends as they emerge. We you know we we can keep ahead by be, by 
boots on the ground, seeing what's happening and, 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 and living and breathing it. That's how I think we've managed to do that. And we've always had the perspective that, you know, real estate is, is, is cyclical uh, in terms of the value uh, um, side of the equation. And uh, it's obviously, uh, as people have just woken up to, although it was always the case, very sensitive to interest, interest rates. And um, so, you know, there are going to be times when values go up and times when values go down. Um, as a long-term investor, that means you want to have relatively low leverage. And it means you need to focus on income. And if you're focusing on income, you've got to focus on your customer because that's the person who's paying the bills. Yeah. So that's, if you like, the, 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 the approach in, in, in what we do. But I think that is a metaphor for the whole of the business, as Valentina has suggested. You know, it is much more of an operational um, business, which means I think that you have to specialize and you have to, do, you have to decide which, where you're going to put your efforts um, and I think to be, you know, to be a, a real estate investor across all of the, uh, all of the segments, you know, you might, uh, or the sectors, you might think, well, that's diversification, probably diversification in that sense equals, uh, you know, uh, more risk rather than less. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so would you, would you say that you're, you're vertically integrated in the sort of context of what we were talking about? To a degree, to a degree. I mean, we're not running a, um, you know, we're not running a hands-on um, serviced office operation, for example. So that might be, you know, another step on the on the vertical integration ladder. Uh, we haven't gone to that uh, uh, extreme um, because actually I think at that level, uh, you need a certain amount of scale. But you wouldn't subcontract your tenant relationships, would you? We wouldn't sub subcontract our tenant relationships across the board, but in the sense that we would, if we were to have, and we do have um, some sort of very short-term serviced office offer in some of our centres, then we would subcontract that to a serviced office specialist, because that is a separate business, because at that level it becomes a day-to-day uh, literally a day-to-day -day operation, which which is not what we're doing. Right. And the same would be true of food and beverage, presumably. And the same would be true of food and beverage. We wouldn't run, uh, you know, a restaurant or a cafe ourselves, but we do have, and I do think uh, it, it is a good thing, we have um, food and beverage operators within our portfolio who we have on a, on a minimum uh, guaranteed rent plus turnover basis. Yes. And I think I think the comments about um, you know retail property going to, on a much more turnover based um, arrangement that's nothing new actually a across Europe that's quite normal we just haven't had it here and I think that's a good thing because retail property is different to office property because retail property is very much a direct factor of production in the retail business you know you're using the premises to generate. You know, the turnover you generate from that store has a, has a very direct relationship to the amount of rent that you can pay yeah. for that yeah. store. Different to an office, you could, you could lease 10,000 square foot to uh, BP. Well, you know, their revenues have got, it, it's completely different. They're not making their revenues from that office. They're making it from oil exploration in yeah. some far-flung place, you know. So that's a, that's a whole different dynamic. Yeah, yeah. But, so I think turnover rents for you know things like retail property are, are, are a good thing because you're aligned um you're aligned to the operation yeah and, and of course there are other property sectors that are perfectly aligned in that way hotels being the most example yeah uh, do you do you see it happening for offices you know the idea of edge property from the netherlands that um but they might be able to evolve a lease that has got a minimum payment of rent and then a top up based on how many people are in the building at any time well, I mean, it, it already exists with service offices, so yeah. that is that is the model. You know, if you do if you do a, a deal with a service office operator, typically, um, you know, sometimes they used to take leases. Very very rare now. Mostly, it's management contracts, and 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 it, and you are it's a turnover type deal. But of course, that that works because they again that's a business. I think that's a more difficult thing. I think this notion that you could do it on the basis of occupancy 
I, I'm not sure about that, you know, because um, almost then if they use their offices uh, more efficiently, they're going to be paying you more rent. Does that yeah. really work? Yeah, it's, a, it's a slightly it, perverse it incentive. It sounds a bit counter, yeah. counter yeah. sort of intuitive. Yeah, it does. So, I mean, what, what about Valentina's point about stranded assets and bringing you back in as well, Valentina? You know, where, where are these stranded assets? What is the... What's the typical, what asset would you like to get your hands on, Valentina, with Peter to sort out? Uh, well, first, I do want to also address the point raised by Peter that you, <clears throat> if you go across multiple verticals, is it diversification or is it a new way to unlock better return? And is it hard? We debate this in the paper quite extensively, and that actually builds into their stranded asset issue. Not that many assets that are currently being stranded, uh, are, it's possible to convert them from, let's say, office to residential. So, so single-use conversions, they're very limited. So the bulk of those assets are not convertible to single-use. They have got to be convert, converted into mixed-use. Uh, so is there a way for investment managers to become a specialist in multiple segments without going full-on uh, into hiring the full teams that would be would be experts. Is there a way to create creatively structure relationships? And Peter, you started talking about it in the co-working space with asset light operators who are specialists uh, and understand the demand side for those various use cases and use types of, of premises uh, that would enable investment managers to achieve superior returns by unlocking mixed use developments. I think there is. Yeah, uh, it's just I, that I mean, it's I not been explored at the moment. Is, look, I think mixed use development, um, as you've alluded to, is the most complex, you know, yes. development type for obvious reasons, and therefore it would require a very bespoke and specialist approach rather than a generic approach. Yes. You know, you might say if if you take it the other end of the scale, I don't know, maybe building a a distribution warehouse is is very generic and you know if you find a motorway junction you can plump it down there you know whether that's in poland or in the uk or whatever that is a generic property type a mixed use development is going to be you know the ingredients of that uh, are going to change in every location because it's going I to I have an example it's going to be it's going to be you know, down to literally the demographics of that particular location, uh, as well as the physical characteristics of uh, of it, the geography, everything. So, yeah. Right. yeah. A great, great example in the US that deals with mixed use is the company called Jamestown. And mm -hmm. I recently saw a case study or kind of an example of what it is a stranded asset to get back to your question, Andrew. Uh, surprisingly, it's one, one time square in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, but it was not used uh, as it was originally designed to be used, and it was impossible to demolish it. So Jamestown is now investing capital and to repurpose um, and retrofit the building. And uh, I'm, I'm reading because it's hard to remember that. The structure would contain only one story of office space. The museum would occupy six stories, and technology so companies high. would be able to list technology companies will be able to lease 12 stories for interactive attractions. That's great, isn't it? But it that is. requires you to, to go out of the comfort zone and yeah. to yeah explore different use cases. Yes. But, you know, there aren't many people that can do that, Valentina. Uh, mean, that's why we're talking about a, the future. You need a special type <laughs> of person. You need an entrepreneur to do that. You know, this isn't yes, something that's which exactly you can, right. you know, you, you can't just suddenly wake that's up one exactly morning right. and say, I'm going to become, a, you know, a mixed use developer because I think that's the future. You know, this is, this is you, you need to have Correct. an entrepreneurial mindset and you also i would suggest need to be deeply rooted in the community in which these um these buildings this 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 development is going to take place you know i i think you know it'd be quite difficult to be a global um mixed-use developer for example you know you just that's tough. What you can do, if you are, yes. are kind of imagining the future of real estate investment management, you can develop an infrastructure 
how to engage with those entrepreneurs. Because as an investment manager, you have a power of capital. Entrepreneurs yeah. don't have capital, sure. but they have good ideas and knowledge, specialist knowledge of the space and the, the micro location, how to unlock the value from the space. So that's where I'm, I'm heading in, kind of, in introducing my vision for the real estate investment yes. manager of the future is the one who is capable of engaging with the world of entrepreneurs for and able to unlock value potential this way. It's very different. So nobody is doing it this way at the moment. Even we, I, think Town, true, I think that's very people. true, but I think that's a very different risk profile of the capital. So that's the other point is that, um, you know, the capital sources have to change and they are changing. But um, yes. one of the things that has shaped, I would suggest, the uh, real estate investment uh, market universe um, has been the requirements of capital. You know, capital that came into real estate uh, traditionally from pension funds, insurance company, was looking for a, a low risk return. They were looking for long leases um, to good quality uh, tenants, um, low, you know, low management requirements. It just about most of them can just about get around to uh, collecting four rental checks a year. Some not so well, but you know, and um, that's what the capital required. Yeah. Um, so yes. But the capital has to change as well. Now, it has changed, actually, because I think actually your some of the statistics that you put up, Andrew, uh, showed that in, institutional um, uh, investment in, in, in real estate has changed quite dramatically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Institutional investment, but other money's come in as well. And what's happened at the same time, I think, is that um, other sources of capital yeah. have come in and those sources of capital some of them are more you know prepared to take a bit more risk which will help fuel operational real estate mixed use development etc i think uh, I, it's probably worth coming back on the um i think the, the jamestown model is quite personally painful for me um yeah. i was on an investment committee about 10 years ago and the first jamestown fund was presented to us as an, as an opportunity which included one time square mm. and most of the revenue from one time square at the time was from advertising hoardings. And I exercised my, my vote uh, to turn down the investment because I didn't understand the economics of advertising hoardings. I suspect that there would be very little hesitation to approve that investment today. You know, 10 years ago, we were struggling with getting our heads around what this really meant, you know, and this is operational real estate, isn't it? It's uh, just yet another new type of real estate investment. And, you know, we in our conversations, we've talked about the sort of the, the logical types of investment management business for the future. And one logical type is is close to the Ashby model, I suspect, not exactly, but close to it, where you've got a vertically integrated sector specialist. You know, you are just really good at understanding the London office market. You understand your customers. You don't want thousands of tenants. You want 100 customer relationships and you want a team that knows those tenants. You know how to deal with the sustainability challenges of the buildings. You know how to make them future proof. And, and I suspect you're earning high rents for them because rents have gone up by a lot more than we expected in for these buildings, you know, because there's because they're rare. So that, that's one logical model, it seems to us. Mm -hmm. The other logical model is to be a pure allocator. You just mm -hmm. take the money and you look for good people doing good things in any any type. You know, it might be Danish student housing, it might be senior it's, living in Spain. You know, it could be it could be advertising hoardings in Times Square, New York City, you know, whatever it is. And you allocate those models. And I, I, it's, it's sort of it doesn't help us get to the answer. We've got a great question, by the way, which says, do, do you see the development market and the investment market splitting in half? Because clearly the challenges of repurposing stranded assets is a completely different challenge from allocating money to successful buildings. So how do we see that working? Well, I think they can't split the heart split in half because they're, they're inexorably linked, really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, in every single way, you need money to develop, and you know, if you or you need to sell your development, you know, to a, to an investor. So, yeah, yeah, or 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 you need the investor to hold the building long term. So exactly. Which, yeah. by the way, you know, you're you're you know, you're joined at the hip, really. Yeah. So that, that's not. probably 
Probably another example of an obsolete real estate model, isn't it? The idea that you do a speculative development, sell it to a pension fund, and they've got to worry then about who they t- lease it to. That that game seems to be changing to me because of sustainability, because of capital requirements. And why wouldn't you just buy into a value-add building that needs development or a stranded asset and hold it long term and operate it? Because the proof of the pudding, this is the Greystyle model, Valentina, isn't it? You know, you your management expertise helps your development decisions and vice versa. And then that helps you raise capital because you're a credible operator of those buildings. What do you think? Valentina, is that for you? It was. Uh, What do I think? Well, we we discussed that it's going to be a bit of a bifurcation on the capital side as well. And then as such, I think that the players will be also very different. as it is in their office sector, for example, everyone, Peter, you started with that. You have wonderful assets in your portfolio in the office uh, because you are buying in the right locations and those will be always performing. So why not to continue this business, right? So that 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 works and that serves your capital, but there will be separate sets of businesses and real estate emerging, which will be effectively increasing the pie. So it's not kind of cutting it in half, it's a different set of capital that is yeah. to support different strategies that are required to unlock opportunities that are represented by those trended assets and trended locations. And that's where it will be led by expertise. That's where I started. And that's where the gray star model is very viable. So you start with no understanding what you can, how you can monetize the space, how you can increase occupancy, how you can increase revenue, cross-sell products, sell non-real estate products, unheard of in real estate. I don't even know where you put it in your Excel spreadsheet, where it's rents and NOIs. So it's 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 a complete hospitality type of business, hospitality plus even. And that I think is going to become a new kind of stream. And I also don't know where the capital will come from. So I know we debate this with Andrew sometimes. So that I would be curious to understand, but it should come from probably uh, different sources. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, if that's okay, we've got um we've got 11, 12 questions on the chat here. So I'm just gonna sort of go through them quickly and see if we can uh uh answer any of them so um great question here how will the risk adjusted return on on portfolios be affected by this transition towards more operational business models uh, in which in which a higher percentage of the noi comes from asset services this is guillermo pk wouldn't this create a higher risk in the in in the asset and in valuations in terms of the noi being more sensitive to occupant services and consumption so in other words, does, does real estate become a riskier asset if you provide more and more services? There's another one which we debate, right? Is it riskier or is it less risky? Because is it not riskier to run your 10-year lease and then at the end of it to, to, to learn that the building is no longer fit for purpose? If you have active asset management component incorporated into your business, does this way building stays relevant all the time? So your effective occupancy is equal to your real occupancy or your 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 economic occupancy. Yeah. Right. So th- this is arguably less risky, but that's not where surveyors uh, and banks are at the moment. So at the moment, this model is still penalized by higher cost of capital because it is perceived riskier, but I would challenge that. Yeah, there's a, there's an analogous point here, I think, isn't there, about um, bank lending. You know, if if the majority of deals are financed partly by debt and banks have loan to value covenants and income coverage covenants. The income coverage covenants work with this quite well, but the LTVs means the valuers have got problems about how you value these assets. And it's another another thing that we expect to see some innovation in. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, we, uh, for example, um, um, you know, when you look at retail leases with turnover elements, typically a valuer won't put any value on the turnover uh, element of the rent until it's been, uh, they have proof of two or, th- or three years. Yeah. So, you know, that's a big problem. Yeah. Um, uh, if, you, if you're deriving a lot of your income, uh, you know, from turnover, just from a valuation perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, great. A question for you, Peter. Um, how do you, how do you, in- how do you ensure ESG compliance and basically how do you respond to the needs of sustainability for your customers well we're you know we're very aware we're all very aware in uh in today's world uh, uh about um 
ESG requirements. What does that mean um, in, the office, the in the office sector? What it means yeah. is, is, is mainly, actually, it means energy consumption and use. That's, right. a, that's a huge part of it. When you look at the life cycle of an office, more than half of the um, of, of the environment imp impact of that building is, is how it's used. And actually, the use of that building is, 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 of course, by the tenant, not the landlord. So that is an interesting dynamic. So, um, you know, we uh, now obviously with the industry is, is slowly moving towards green leases where the where, where the uh, landlord can have some control over how the tenant uses the building. But frankly, that's still quite a long way off. Because most people, the rent a building will say, I'll use it how I want. So um, what we can do as landlords is we can obviously build buildings in a more sustainable way. Um, and we can reuse buildings and we can look at the carbon impact of our development. Uh, and that's where we have the most uh, control. And we've seen huge changes, I would say, in the last five years um, as to how the industry um, is operating. And indeed, how the planning system operates to give you permits to actually uh, make changes. Right. OK. So in that respect, the planning system is a force for good rather than a block. It is a force for good uh, in that. But uh, like a lot of things, um, it, it, sometimes it gets it wrong, yeah. badly wrong. And uh, I, I would say that it... it, it it can be a bit subjective, and sometimes, you know, they take a, a, a one-size-fits-all, broad-brush approach, that uh, every building should be saved and you can't knock any buildings down. Well, that's not right, because some buildings are basically functionally obsolete for all sorts of uses and would be better being, um, you know, putting up a brand-new sustainable building. Um, so... You know, that particular debate does have some nuances and uh, there needs to be more sophistication in the way things are looked at. Coming back to you, Clara, um, to wrap up, um, just before we do that, a question for you, Valentina, which is to what extent are investors prepared to put money uh, with innovative managers? In other words, to what extent are LPs prepared to fund innovation? Are those who are making the decision going to be rewarded by taking those risks? In other words, is, is VC investment... Uh, compatible with property investment? Very difficult. It's a very hard question. So um, currently, real estate investors are not being re rewarded by their by their LPs uh, for being innovative. So you've got to have a very strategic view um, on business and life to set aside this capital. It's simply because even in public markets, right? I spent 10 years in investment banking and then still this day, real estate DCF stocks are compared to NAV of their portfolio. There is no DCF on strategic decision making. There is no value assigned to, uh, to innovation. It's, um, it's difficult to innovate in real estate. Now, if you anticipate that it will have direct impact on the value of the, of the assets, that's, I think, the bad and the economics that you need to go through in your mind in order to unlock this capital and put it, put it aside in your kind of P&L or balance sheet um, and start investing. When it comes to real estate entrepreneurs who experiment with space, they are most disadvantaged because they are neither a target of venture capital funds nor a target of property investors, which is a mistake. And I do anticipate that it will change, but at present that's a very disadvantaged part of the market, but I can spend another hour on it, so let's keep oh. it short. Okay, thank you very much. Clara, we've had questions. Um, over to you. Thank you all for such a wonderful webinar. It's been fascinating to listen to you debating these topics. And I'm sure everyone joining us has been delighted to hear your discussions. Um, I'd just like to say that, the, again, this webinar is in support of the Oxford Real Estate Programme, but we do have a wide portfolio of finance programmes here at Said Business School uh, with a few on the screen coming up. Um, we have options of both in-person programmes uh, here in Oxford and we do have some online programmes that are available. Um, so if you are interested in diving more into some of the topics that we discussed today, please do get in touch or if there is a programme on the screen that you would like to talk a bit more about, please do get in touch. Um, just moving on to the next slide where possible. Yeah. 
Yes. Thank you. Um, so the real estate program is coming up this year from the 17th to the 21st of June. It's a five day executive program that's here in Oxford and applications are open if this webinar has piqued your interest and you want to spend some more time with Professor Baum and to discuss um, the topics that we've been talking about, please do get in touch uh, and make your applications. Um, we do have a great cohort, usually 40 to 45 participants, where you can network and really uh, get to know other people from different areas within the private, uh, from the real estate sector, and really be engaged with a global cohort from over 20 different countries topic, talking about topics that we've picked apart today. So if you are interested in joining the programme, please do get in touch with myself. My name is Clara, and we have a QR code on the next slide for those of you who do have smartphones you can scan the QR code and get in touch um, I contact details will also be on the website uh, for the program um, thank you again to Andrew Valentina and Peter for having time with us here today and also thank you all for joining us it was delightful to also see some new and familiar faces in the chat uh, in the audience as well so thank you for joining us uh, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon early morning or evening thank you again and have a great day thanks, thanks thank, you. thank you thanks everybody thanks Peter thanks Valentina Thank you.